and we'll start our audience, our local audience. Okay, welcome everyone. We're just going to start in a moment. Okay, just allowing our local Zoom audience here to come in. Welcome to everyone on YouTube. Welcome to everyone coming in here now on Zoom. We're just gonna take a second. I see that's a little bit slow and populating today. Welcome to the Friday webinar. I'm Derek Auger, the Executive Director with Conservatory Canada. And we have back Deborah Wanless here for part two on her series, Let's Begin, which is a piano method that she authored years back for beginner piano. And I encourage you, if you haven't seen the first one, to go back and have a look at that. Uh, and I'll post a link in a little bit here in the chat box so you can bookmark that more easily. Uh, Deb has a handout here, and I'm just going to throw that in the chat box for the first time now so it's there. And I'll post it again in a moment because there are people going to come in late and they're not going to be able to see that chat until after they've joined. So you'll see that pop up in a couple minutes as well. And I'll just talk for a minute here about the upcoming schedule for May. May is the last month that we're going to hold the Friday webinar. Once we get into June, there are a lot of exams and things going on at Conservatory Canada uh, that we have to take care of. So I'm not going to be able to host webinars throughout the summer. I will see everyone that's going to be at the CFMTA convention later on in July, July 6 and 7, I believe it is, uh, in Edmonton. I look forward to seeing any of you in person if you're going to be there or planning to be there. We'll also have an online platform. That's a hybrid convention. And I'll be online as well if anyone wants to coordinate and, and hang out there. So in the meantime, we have four more webinars coming up next Friday. You're going to get me by myself here again. And we're going to talk about, I'm just going to give you an update from CC basically. There are a number of things, a number of doors we're pushing on. So I want to give you an update on different things that have been going around my desk. Um, some topics I'll bring up about uh, an in-person, or a, not an in-person, but an August examining session, what the future of that is. I want to talk to you about various aspects of our theory exams, just to dispel a couple of myths. I'll we'll talk to you about our publications a little bit. I can talk to you about June exam centers, uh, flex exams, as well as Zoom exam protocols. I know a number of you have teach or have questions about that. We haven't really touched on that in the last couple of years. And we have a good technical document on our website that goes over that. But I'd like to highlight a few of those things for the glut of exams that we have coming up online here in the next couple of months. I want to talk about contemporary idioms, syllabus a little bit, as long as well as the etudes, and, and a few other things. Every day I keep adding things to this list. So it's going to be a long list of things that I can talk with you and update you on, as well as take your questions. Questions on absolutely anything to do with CC. I'm willing to answer. That's next Friday. The Friday after that, on May the 12th, we'll have Eleanor Gummer here from One Eye Publications, who's going to talk about her beginner method um, called Piano Kids. And um, it's a really sort of back to basics kind of approach. It's really interesting. And I encourage you all to attend that. Right before the long weekend on Friday, May 19th, we're going to have Olivia Riddell here uh, from MYC, Music for Young Children, who's going to give us a presentation on the whole MYC program and what it's all about. We're really looking forward to that. They're a longtime collaborator of ours. And then on the 26th of May, we're going to have Cecile and Eleanor back to do the final webinar for the year. And it's their final installment uh, for the year on music by women and BIPOC composers. And I'm not sure exactly what they're talking about, but you'll you'll get that in your inbox, those of you who are on the email list. You will have registration links for all four webinars next week in your inbox. Look for that midweek, as well as on the CC Teachers Facebook group page. So I'm gonna turn this over to Deb here to give us part two of Let's Begin. Uh, part one was really well received. Um, I'll put a link to that in the chat box, and, and I hope you'll all watch this. And those of you watching this on replay, I hope you enjoy. Deb, I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks, Derek. Welcome, everyone. <clears throat> As Derek said, we're going to talk about the second part. Last time, we talked largely about the A level of my Let's Begin, and uh, we'll just now uh, work through uh, the other levels. Uh, Everything that we talked about before still applies. Um, by now, you know that, that I do love quotes and I have a few of these. They are in your handout if you enjoy them. So each student presents a unique collection of personality traits and learning preferences. 
In the words of Forrest Gump, if you're old enough to know Forrest Gump, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Um, like a box of chocolates, Pioma students bring many surprises, but only if you are prepared to uncover them. So I talk a lot about learning styles because it really is a passion of mine that we need to know our children, we need to watch and learn. We need to understand that we relate best to the children who learn in a similar manner to us. We also need to know that as we're watching the children, we start to think we need to add labels, not true. Some things will change with that child in different situations and you will get surprises as you go along with the children as they grow, as they learn, as they mature and all of those things. So it's about being flexible as well, especially in the early years. Children are not things to be molded, but people to be unfolded. When you learn how to learn in your preferred style, the way that best suits your brain. It's like writing with your preferred hand. It really is a natural thing. And Derek and I were just chatting for a few minutes. One of the things that I know a lot of us shy away from is wanting to play uh, for the highly audio student. And in fact, that student needs you to play, maybe not everything. And of course, we want to work on other aspects of their learning. But if we take that away, suddenly we take away their natural learning ability and we make everything really challenging. And I think it's probably one of the reasons that we sometimes lose these students because we can't, we become a bit frustrated with their uh, reading. It doesn't quite keep pace to what they're able to play. That's just something that we have to learn to think through and deal with for me. Last week, we talked a lot about the creative learning papers, and I just want to show you a, a collection that I didn't talk about last week, but we also have a teacher's edition of this. And so we know from last week that these include things like finger plays, whole body learning, improv, sight, or visual aspects, oral aspects. And we put the, all of the papers, the A and the B papers together in a teacher's book where you have additional ideas being given for the papers. You have the same instructions in the same paper itself, but you also have room to make some notes there for the future, what you might want to do with this in addition, because you want to be creative, use every page to the fullest. But our finger plays, of course, do everything from building technique to teaching um, hand designation and finger numbers. And improv allows the student to be creative, building keyboard geography, building creativity, um, and technical skills while they're learning to read. And we need to remember that once they start reading, we sometimes limit those things and need to be careful of that. Last week, I also talked about this, the directional reading, especially when it's nonstop. So I just put this slide in to show you. I mentioned about turning the page sideways on uh, Bigfoot. And this allows us to, the arrows are slanting, for example, the right hand from um, going from the right to the left, because some students think the right hand is only going to ascend. So this is something that we can help them with. I also like to create cardboard keyboards in our studio, and that way we can glue them or tape them together so we create many octaves, but we can also hold it upright so that they can see what up looks like naturally to them and then lay it back down on the keyboard to match. And suddenly these images start to fall into place because high and low, up and down is not what this child comes in perceiving it to be. So we want to think of um, creative ways that we can help them visually with this. I am big about posture needs to be checked for forever. And I have this kind of fun thing that I do, especially at festivals, even with intermediate students who, you know, have grown excessively since they started lessons and posture needs to be really addressed. So I tend to have this fun thing that we talk about that I tell them are, I'm going to make their feet magic. I'm going to make them stick to the floor. So we use this activity box from the posture check and we do everything the same, except that when we get to the number two item, 
I ask them to imagine that the bench has three stripes um, running parallel, of course, to the keyboard. So the first stripe is a green stripe closest to the keyboard. The middle stripe is a yellow stripe. The furthest from the keyboard stripe is a red stripe. So you immediately know that even little children know what that green means go, yellow is caution and red is don't go there. And so we can have this whole discussion about that. I've actually had teachers who made bench covers uh, like this so that when they were working with a lot of little children, all they had to remind them of was uh, green zone, you know, green light, and they immediately adjust their posture to make it work. Then you follow all of the other checklists right down to number six. And I ask if I can place my hand on the middle of the student's back or close to it and discuss that their hands and arms are going to remain the same as they've done on the checklist. And that my hand is going to make sure that their back and torso also remain in that posture. And then you invite them to lift both feet at the same time without changing any position. And of course, it's magic. The feet are stuck to the floor and it's so much fun, especially for older students. They're, they do their best to try to come up with a way that that's going to happen. But what it's teaching them is that we play with our whole body. We need our feet in an appropriate position to maintain balance and control as we play. So when I talk a minute about when we move from on staff, moving to on staff reading, we talked uh, significantly about moving from black keys to white keys last week and what becomes important. But especially when we move to staff reading, the different sensory modalities relate to different things. They all need to work with these things, but at the same time, uh, if we go to their strength when we first teach something new, it will be learned more efficiently, more quickly. So the tactile learners benefit from using tin staff sheets with magnets because they're literally moving notes about and they're manipulating those into whatever you want it to be, but literally hands-on learning. Kinesthetic learners respond to large staff floor mats so that they're up and moving. These kids need to be moving to learn. If you expect them to sit quietly while they're learning some new concepts, especially in pre-teaching, you can have them moving about or standing at the table. And this will really help them intake the information. So they can be stepping on these or they can be placing like large notes or I mentioned this last week, if they're hockey players, let them play, put pucks on it, bean bags. And this way they can also start to understand and discuss about lines and spaces, what that looks like, how they, how they manipulate the staff as well as a floor keyboard. Of course, we know this is whole body learning. We know that every type of sensory modality benefits from whole body learning. Visual and audio learners will gain considerable understanding of the staff through these same activities. Remember that most of the young children that come to us are tactile and kinesthetic, and then they develop visual. Uh, but these, these activities in this case for tactile and, and kinesthetic will really help um, your visual and audio learners as well. So like the A book, the B book has just two books, um, the, the piano book and the creative learning sheets. So it revisits all the same thing. It reviews posture, hand designation, hand position, finger numbers, uh, the recently learned treble bass clefs, as well as the grand staff, signpost reading, all things that they have already learned. And by this point, we have discussed and we know that most young children are tactile or kinesthetic when they come to us. The younger they are, the more obvious that will be why they have trouble sitting down. Then moving toward visual and finally audio. Our job is to make sure that every student strengthens each one of those sensory modalities. They can change from task to task. Like I said earlier, you just think you have them figured out and all of a sudden they surprise you with something. It might be they are more stressed, they're more tired, they've uh, sort of moved forward in their school learning, different things that can change how this is happening. The number of students exhibiting visual learning increases steadily until about the age of 10. 20 to 30% of the population exhibit audio learning tendencies through life. 40% are visual. So we're teaching music, which is audio. The largest group 
of learners will be visual. So we have to work on developing the audio aspect for them. The remaining 30% fall into these two categories combined, a tactile and kinesthetic. Most students will have one prominent sensory modality, um, but may have a second one that is stronger than the other two. It's our job to get these other senses working to capacity. So this is an area that we can impact and improve for the children. So it's our job to teach to their strengths, uh, but strengthen the lesser developed modalities through our teaching. As teachers, we relate best to students who learn in a similar style to our own. Um, years ago, we used to call it personality conflicts. I don't think it's that at all. I think it's that these children learn differently than we do, and that can sometimes frustrate us. So we have to start to begin to approach it, our normal teaching, in a different way. And remember, it's so important. Ask, don't tell, and use every page to the fullest. I don't think there's any method book can, that can tell you all the different things you could do on a given page. So I think it's really important that we don't have to be terribly creative. We just have to have a list of things that we could bring into play. We have to avoid becoming turn the page teachers. We've been kind of spoiled by all of these great method books that are on the market. And it's easy for us to just want to keep going, uh, but we need to think through every activity. And did I touch on all of these sensory modalities within this lesson and so on. Tips for developing sensory modality uh, comes into play with our lesson plans. So your goal is to make sure that you're using, utilizing each sensory modality and introducing um, repertoire in different ways, activities in different ways. We very often approach each new page in the method book as a reading exercise. That's only tapping into visual students. We need to figure out how we would do it from an audio perspective and have everybody do that. We need to figure out how we would approach it from a tactile approach and so on. Begin each lesson by appealing to the child's preferred learning style. So you want to go to their strength first. So an example would be audio learners. You're gonna begin with a game or activity which allows for creative playing. So this could be improvisation, this could be playing by rote, uh, could be singing, any of those things. Then you want to follow that same activity or moving that activity to another aspect of what they're doing by including at least one other approach to that, that activity. So if they're doing rope playing, one of the things that you might want to do with the little people, you'll have to do the writing, but maybe writing down the blank rhythm or a couple of bars of the blank rhythm so they can start to see how it looks. You can have a discussion on that and then ask them to clap it while reading it, counting out loud or things like that. So that's how we're gonna improve an audio's reading as we go, but that's moving from audio to visual in terms of our teaching uh, approach. We want to work through other approaches throughout the lesson. So you might not do all four sensory modalities with one activity because you want to move on to other things. And I would really suggest that as the child starts to get tired, you want to consider returning to their preferred style for the final activity so that they feel really happy, really excited, and not like they're slugging through that last thing and can't wait to get out of the lesson. The highly kinesthetic students may benefit when working through several approaches before settling at the keyboard. We often get questions about, you know, what do I do with these kids who are fidgeting, can't sit still? Well, the fact is, that's how they learn. So we want to start with something that's whole body learning. Whole body activity could be related to what you set them home to do, it could be something new, but whole body. Then slow, slow it down a little bit to maybe even a finger play, which requires moving from whole body to just fine finger, um, small muscle. Try then going to a table and discussing some written work that's going to be related to something new or what they've been doing. Uh, could be with really young children, just an activity, a game or coloring. And by then hopefully you're settling them a little bit and you can move to the piano where you're going to require more concentration. That's going to wear thin and you're going to have to move on. One of the things that you can do with your finger plays is when you see them start to fidget, you could just start in and say, um, open them, shut them, give a, so you just start jumping into those things that they already know, and it changes the focus immediately. 
<clears throat> and brings them back to the tasks at hand. So <clears throat> you're going to see how our pages look very similar in the B book. Of course, we're starting with the signpost reading as a review. <clears throat> we still have our site reading, which is site clapping in this game and in this case and rhyming and lots of really great staff keyboard to staff cues still going on in this book. The balloons are still there. Great little images, still black and white. Um, this is also, we haven't had a lot of triple meter because it's one of the most difficult meters for the child to really understand and digest because of course our heart is not in triple meter. Uh, we walk with two feet. Our, our whole body rhythm is either duple or quadruple, however you want to look at it. And triple meter by some children constantly gets changed to um, four, four. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> at workshops, I'll often ask teachers how they approach whole body learning to triple meter. And ultimately the answers that I get, excuse me, my voice is still a bit scratchy. <clears throat> is through waltzing or swaying, which are really great things. That's where we want to get to, but we need to be able to teach rhythm from the inside out and then they internalize it easily. And it becomes as simple as taking a little dance, giving it some, some ideas. We know that the child knows what stepping means. We know that they probably know very young what tiptoe means. <clears throat> so you, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. If you combine those two things, you end up with step, tip, toe, step, tip, toe. And suddenly we're swaying, if we're moving, we're dancing the waltz, the two things that teachers are looking to do. But we've learned it from the inside out. And what happens now is that's with them for life. Every sensory modality is going to benefit. This is how I teach triple meter, because we internalize it first, we put on little accompaniment takes, method book accompaniments, and dance to it. And the other thing that this does is it gives a natural rhythm because we hear this step, tip, toe, step. So we hear the natural pulse going on as well. If we were going to approach the teddy bear dance from a tactile approach, uh, so just as an example of a different approach to teaching the reading of this, I would take it to the table and we'd work on the fingering of one, five, five, one, five, five, one, Five. We, of course, have already clapped some of this, but that's just an example of starting it in a different way, not just visually reading and playing, but taking away the sound and working on fingering and touch. Uh, these are simply some of the creative learning papers that reinforce triple meter. Um, pre-teaching it, you could use these as pre-teaching, you can use them as reinforcement. It can also hippity hoppity, the kangaroo hop could also be pre-teaching staccato touch without talking about the word staccato. And of course, once again, we're working out um, things with whole body learning and acting these things out, which is really important for every sensory modality. We're still bringing in the tip, step tiptoe is really a whole body learning sheet, while the keyboard hop is actually an improvisation sheet. Continuing with talking about uh, the signpost reading, we add our new notes through um, adding them to signpost reading. But we're also getting into hands together playing. So you can see how this is working, that we're um, parallel our signposts. So we're playing perfect fast is what we're doing. And we make sure we, we're continuing to use the listening game to develop major minor sounds uh, throughout the, the method books, lots of appealing titles. So we're adding tonalities, major minor. Um, we're doing pentatonic, whole tone. Here with the I'm a hippopotamus is actually bringing clusters into play. So um, getting them in working on a little bit of dissonance without it being threatening and using the black keys as an anchor um, to do that. Again, listening games, building audio, and using animals often. That's our kids are love, love animals, are interested in them. It grabs their attention very quickly. Here's the example of we're using, um, adding the, the D and it's going to be 
uh, developed around the signposts. So we're using middle C, of course, in conjunction, which would be quite normal. Um, great visuals. Still wording word, using word association. So when you sing the lyrics, which we want them to do to internalize sound, um, we use a D letter in, in the words. And we have a, a creative learning sheet that talks about the repeated note and little song. Again, you can download these backing tracks for the creative learning and for the method book from our website. Um, so if we're teaching um, things, new concepts, visually and tactually, we're doing that through rhyming, we're doing it through seeing the notes on the page, could be tapping them on the tabletop for tactile. And once again, also doing that so that they're working with the fingers and you're stripping down the amount of information for an audio student. You're asking them to read, but you're not expecting them to be able to have a complete physical reaction at the keyboard initially. So here's a combination where the signpost is showing up with little star. We're also with activity boxes asking them to transpose these things just through um, telling them where to place their hands and so that's tactile. They're using their ear um, to develop this and it's something that we should be teaching right from the beginning. You can see how the activity pages are directly related in the method book to the repertoire. Some more examples of improvisation. This, uh, the Brontosaurus, of course, is from the creative learning. We do include some of it in our method book. So once again, creating, developing creativity, keyboard geography, experimentation. We're using appealing themes and words with various meters. So this is a triple meter one, of course, with the um, fishies. And uh, just makes for great work for not only audio, tactile, and kinesthetic learners, but you may have to do some coaching with your visual learners to get them to experiment. Uh, your producers will want to make sure that they're doing it correctly. And so these things become great tools that we work on. I call, like to call it controlled improvisation, but it's really helpful for quite a number of uh, not only sensory modalities, but dispositions. Uh, while you're working through the B book, you can see the topics that we're doing, constantly having keyboard images, um, staff images. These are two are not associated to each other. They're, they're independent, but building language of what a step is and what a skip is and how we're going to make that work. These little action figures draw in your kinesthetic learners because it appeals to them to see that sort of thing. So written exercises and repertoire followed right away um, in these. In the creative learning papers, you also have some flashcards. Flashcards are really important. We didn't talk about this the last time. But tactile learners love to handle flashcards. They love to hold them. They love to feel them. They love to deal them. They love to do all of those things. Visual learners, um, remember, they, they store and visualize the information. So they look at the picture and they interpret that as what it needs to be. Uh, but they also will be attracted to how the notes are moving. And they will start to read early and use some of their written words that we're doing. The kinesthetic relate to the action figures within this. So they're, they're looking at it that way. So simplify and isolate the amount of reading required for the audio learner. You have to live with, I think, the fact that audio learners can play much more advanced work than their reading, but you continue to work with their reading and try, you, you try to close the gap. The relator disposition, love to turn these into interactive games. So laying them out or, or again, playing a card game where you have to pull a card and demonstrate what it is or go to the piano and talk about what it is, verbalize it, whatever. And producers love to reverse roles. So they like if you, they become the teacher and you have to answer, be sure to give some wrong answers because they also have to determine whether you're correct or incorrect. You can see just like the A book, if you were here, lots of familiar tunes and styles of tunes, seasonal tunes happening. Transposition, as I mentioned, is happening throughout the book and needs to be started really easy uh, and use every page to the fullest. It doesn't really matter whether I told you to transpose or not. Those early black key pieces in book A 
pull them out and have them transpose them to white keys. They could go down a semitone, up a semitone, but use the every page to the fullest. Transpose everything and anything that you can, can do. Um, Susan Garcia has a website and she talks about learning styles and she, uh, this is really important. I think that you purchase, order, design and create materials that embrace a wider range of learning styles. Um, not every method book has thought of this through in the same way and it becomes important. Now that doesn't mean that you can't bring these ideas into a different method book because you certainly can. You need to be aware of where um, we might need to increase certain things, adapt certain things to make it work. By the time the students are finished the B book, they're reading A to E around middle C, uh, plus the signpost middle C and F and G. They are doing simple uh, time signatures with the quarter note still as the image underneath. And they've done lots of rhythm clapping, finger plays, whole body learning and rhyming. Their tonalities include major, minor, pentatonic, whole tone. And remember, they even did a cluster to develop some dissonances. Technique is being built through repertoire, finger plays, whole body activities, and even improvisation. They've got sight reading with their blank, blank rhythm, clapping, repertoire, and of course, flashcards. Listening games are building audio skills as are improvisation, duets, and there are free backing tracks to download. Uh, the theory is being developed through activity pages. They're transposing, they're vocalizing by singing the lyrics and rhyming. They're developing organizational skills. They're tracking the checklists. They're coloring in their, their balloons for practice records. And memory is being built through these things like the lyrics, but finger plays and whole body activities, all tools that we want to build on our journey to conservatory work. I think we need to talk a little bit about technique. Um, when good technical habits are taught from the first lesson and reinforced diligently during subsequent lessons, students learn, learn to play comfortably and effortlessly. <clears throat> so one of the books that I've created is called Dinosaur and Friends Scale Tales. You can use this with any series. You can teach it by rote or by note. It is designed to, do, to appeal to all sensory modalities through the approach and through language. <clears throat> so visual learners may be reading right away. So they might, they might look at the notes and use those, but many of the other sensory modalities will just know what it is. Uh, tactile will grasp the five finger pattern very quickly. This is pentatonic scales, <clears throat> sorry, pentascales. And um, it doesn't really matter if the audio or kinesthetic learners are recognizing the notes at this point. You can also download, um, we've done little keyboard cues that you can print on labels and glue them to the pages if you wanna have the keyboard association here as well. But you'll notice that there's language that's really important. So what happens is the child is going on a journey with this dinosaur called Rex and they're doing all of these activities. So the kinesthetic learner is going to respond to things like activity related, like walking, um, popping, shouting, those are all things that will relate and attract the kinesthetic learner. The audio learner will relate to experimenting with sound at the piano, so loud, soft, but they will also love things that um, <clears throat> are natural in what would it sound like if I'm shouting um, or if I'm making a certain kind of noise. So that is how they're going to relate to that and they're going to be listening to all of the things that they can do with it. Well, the tactile learner just loves to be the proficiency that they can, can establish through um, pentascales. Penta and this last little exercise here has them closing their eyes and playing the five finger pentascale. And uh, they just love that. They just think it's really cool that they can do that very quickly. Tactile learners are the kids who are playing the same piece over and over and over again because they feel proficient technically and um, they might drive you a little crazy with that. We didn't talk at length about this last week where um, different dispositions, we, I mentioned them, but I moved on, but I wanna talk about them now because they really do uh, come into play very strongly with dinosaur scales. The performer loves the creativity, spontaneous, playful challenges. So the things 
that the students are doing with the dinosaur, what they're doing as they're going through. You can tell at a glance here, the dinosaur is really shy and hiding behind a tree. The producer loves these checklists. So they love the order. They love the list. They love the sequential style. They will not skip over a number. They, they have to do each one of those. They have to touch every dot. The inventor is allowed to be creative um, when they, they add spots to their dinosaur. And so the, what they do is they can become creative about other new ways to play these five finger scales and how they might play them differently. And that's encouraged and should be encouraged, including transposing them to include all major five finger patterns as they become proficient. The relator and inspirer connects to the idea of teamwork. You and the dinosaur are working together and they really enjoy the storytelling that's happening um, between the events of technique and the actual uh, action and, and uh, events that the students are playing with for and with the dinosaur. Thinker creator, they're always contributing new ideas. So you can really get them to do these new things and transpose. This child responds to the creative concepts, the ar artistic aspects, and thought-inducing process. This is the kind of student who will come into your lesson and tell you that they've changed the ending of this piece because they think it's better this way. They're not being disrespectful. They're being thinkers and creators. So, what this book does is you have the pentascales and then later we get introduced to Octavia who teaches one octave scales uh, through tetrachords and through the circle of fifths. We also develop intervalic reading, again, same creative aspect, same checklist, appealing language for, for the various modalities. Here we get into some solfege with movable dough because that is really how, um, um, pianists think. You could just give them numbers as well, which will be really helpful in how they think about this for intervals and so on later. Um, so at the C level, there really are all of these books. What I want to mention, though, is that the Dinosaur Scale book can start earlier than the C level. And um, there's a slide here that gives us the exact page. But basically we have, we're going to be doing dinosaur scales. We're going to be doing the, the lesson book, which is now uh, portrait. There's one theory book, but there are two performance books. So I would just want to pause to talk about this. Um, it's so easy to just download everything and, and fill binders with pages. And I think that's, there's great value in that. I'm, I'm not dissing that in any way. I think we need to remember, and of course, COVID really didn't help us with our thinking here. We had to do what we had to do. Children love to receive new books. And I think you've probably experienced this, where they grab the book and they clutch it to their chest, um, basically giving it a hug. And if you watch that child, the child sees this book as progress and success. They see that you, the teacher, believe in them. That's why you're giving them a new book. They see it as interesting and exciting, often stimulating new and renewed practice habits. And they believe it's a new adventure waiting to be unraveled. And as educators, we are often really touched by that gesture. I've had teachers saying to me, yes, my student has done that. And you know, it brought tears to my eyes. And that's really wonderful that you're feeling, feeling that. But we don't want to miss the message. The message is all of those other things. And it's like if you could convince grandma to buy them a new book, that's going to be a lovely gesture. Uh, so it is important that we have new books along the way. So dinosaurs can start partway through the B series for that reason. You're going to do one performance book at a time. And that allows you to bring something new in as they're working through their method book and their theory book, because the method book and theory book are substantial. And we don't want to miss out on these other things. We have to figure out, instead of asking the parent to buy four or five new books at one time, how do we make this work? And how do we get that reaction from our kids with a new book? So what happens is, like I said, 
Uh, this can be incorporated as early as about page 38 of the Let's Begin B. So just watch the children know when they're ready and you can bring this into play. They might not be reading those notes initially, so you might be teaching them by rote. So basically, you can start with these three books, the, the piano book, the theory fun book, the fun with, for, with performance. Honestly, it doesn't matter what the supplemental book is, but you probably need the third book to reinforce um, everything that they're doing in their performance or method book. Same things as we saw in B. We are adding more transposition, a little bit more theory. Um, we have, again, great appealing uh, repertoire, I think. Uh, and great companion material, the free, free backing tracks, but we keep the practice balloons going. They're not as obvious, they're up in the corner, a little bit different, but listening game, sight reading, all of those things are happening. The theory book, I think that children who have fun with theory in the beginning will embrace it throughout their studies. It's very much a see and do approach, meaning that they look at the page and they know it's required. It's fun, the broad range of activities. It's not pages and pages of the same topic. It's much freer than that. It is a standalone series. The activity pages within the method book directly relate to the repertoire they're learning. The theory is more independent. It's ideal for any middle C methodology, but the goal is that it's also sending our Canadian children on a journey to be prepared for the rudiment programs they're going to learn. Take the time to talk about the piano a little bit again, uh, this high, low, whole situation. So by everyone seeing the images, this is just the bottom one, the horizontal one is just the top one turned sideways, getting the concept of high and low going. We include word searches, crossword puzzles, lots of games, lots of keyboard to staff association, but also staff to keyboard. Some children have uh, much success going one way, but not both ways. So theory books need to make sure they do both. Um, we have matching games, which are uh, problem solvers, spelling bees, so note naming, coloring. And something that I think we're dealing with today, families are extremely busy and parents will often suggest, I don't know if you experienced this or not, but often suggest that they do not want their child to study theory. I really think what they're saying to us is that, please, no theory homework. So I think the way we solve that problem is we need to have longer lessons. Whoever invented the 30 minute piano lesson is not a piano teacher. We need to have longer lessons so that we can make sure we cover everything in an appropriate way. Much better to have a 45 minute lesson. Um, if cost is an issue, maybe you overlap that 40 minute less, 45 minute lesson for 15 minutes with a student at the same level so that they're working on the same things. This is where you could do uh, more of the theory, more of the um, audio games, um, sight reading even, things like that, um, playing with the backing tracks. But I think it becomes really important. And I think you also have to accept the fact that audio and kinesthetic students probably need to do their theory in front of you. Very often they're doing their theory in the car on the way to lessons, which is not helpful because seven days have lapsed and the ideas have probably lapsed with them. So the whole goal is when you learn something is to put pen to paper and work with it right away. And that's how you're going to remember it. Word searches and crosswords are a really valuable resource for teaching and developing horizontal and vertical reading, which is really important at the piano and help develop problem solving, which is processing at the piano. So the theory books cover clefs, keyboard, notes, and rest values appropriate at this level, al the musical alphabet, basic time signatures, including bar lines, measures, counting, writing and counting, ties. There's some fun things where they're naming that tune. So they're taking some things to the piano, doing a little bit of sight reading and, if, and sharps and flats at this level. Great tunes for the student to uh, use similar to what we've been doing, some uh, quick study pieces they could be used at. I think kids need to work at different levels 
um, instead of just only the method book where it's kind of top end. This could be a standalone series. It could be a great way to test a transfer student to see, you know, when mom says I've taught them a little bit, just to see what they have learned because the same great visual cues, activity boxes are here as well. Um, easily transposed, easily singable. So I know they're not new tunes, but they're just as new to children as they were to us when we were growing up. And these tunes are also tunes that um, they can play by ear later and learn to harmonize, which of course we're already developing some of that from an audio perspective with the duets. So back to the method book, we start in with rests. We have not done these to this point. We're going to introduce them slowly and easily. The activity pages now are a little bit more detailed and more frequent. They give clear explanations on how to write them, explaining the images, and you can see how they come into play very comfortably, easily, seeing all the same things that we've seen in the A and B book. Um, we still do keyboard to staff association. We're still doing blank rhythms, so sight reading. Listening games are happening in relationship to what they've been working on. We have the free backing tracks. There's still some duets here. Um, we're cross-referencing to the performance fun book so you know what pieces are available. And here you can see how we've, we've evolved to bringing the rest into play. Still lots of things in improvisation. So this one is an A minor pentascale. So we're working through that just as we are doing in dinosaur scales. Appealing titles. So this is interesting. Kids enjoy winter time. Um, Continued controlled improvisation, important for our visual learners. And we start to explore the damper pedal. So we can work on the physical aspects and posture check here so that we just use the damper pedal in a continuous manner to start with the improvisation. And uh, we can get some really cool sounds going with that. Uh, continued um, clear explanations. You'll notice that we have transitioned at this point to, this is page 16, 17, um, to morphing the time signature from the quarter note on the bottom in the top and say to the number four on the bottom with a clear explanation. That activity box on the left, use it again to the fullest. And this is, there's suggestions here. You could have them clap this rhythm. They're adding bar lines. They're adding letter names. So have them count out loud, have them play it, have them transpose, transpose it. Maybe they could create, this is a four measure phrase. Maybe they could create an answer for improvisation. So use them as much and as, as often as possible for creative ideas. Of course, we're teaching things like ties here, we're expanding dynamics, um, again, fun titles, your kinesthetic students love this whole idea of hoot and holler, activity boxes, still working well for things like the tactile learners, um, where they're, they're tracing ties in the music, but also putting pen to paper. And when they're studying their music in this way, we're, we're developing processing, they're not just going to jump in and start to play, they're actually learning what should I do before I start? And that is looking through the music. So. so again, just going to go quickly through here, improv where we can start to do um, staccato um, in a very natural way. Uh, some non-pitched notes, meaning no, no clef, so they can, you can be sure they're reading steps and skips and repeated notes. We're actually using a Lydian mode with this one. Lots of familiar titles. Lots of new things happening, um, just very slowly building all of the information. Um, language becomes really important. Uh, and this is a good example where we introduce the flat. And when a flat is placed before a note, the note is lowered to the next black or white key to the left. So I'm using a lot of different descriptions there that will uh, tap into all, all types of modality. So it becomes really important. So we're bringing accidentals and key signatures into play. Um, you can see we've got pickups going on. We've got sight reading. 
uh, we're expanding our reading often with hand crossing. So the second line of it ain't going to bring, um, we're actually crossing the right hand over to that high C as we're first learning to do it. Also seeing eighth notes and um, just lots going on, building slowly. Again, sight reading, transposition is on the move, reviews, matching games for problem solving. Again, some we're starting to bring in classical music. So our major composers are starting to have little stories added, um, expanding their reading. We've got all kinds of styles, jazz, fun pieces that kids might have been singing, um, you know, from recordings and so on. So this list is in your, in your handout. I'm not going to take the time to read through it with you. Let me just give you the page if you want to zip to that point. Um, page eight of the handout gives you the complete list of what has been covered in our <clears throat> C-level by the time they're finishing. If the child is not learning the way you are teaching, then you must teach in the way the child learns. We touched on this last week or two weeks ago, but it's about you have to go to what that child brings in. If they're not being able to go to the piano right away, if they want to sit on the floor, get on the floor and chat and come up with some activity that you can work on, but you need to go to what the child needs you to do. D, of course, level is the final level of the series. We've already talked about where scale tales could be. This could be finished by this point. There are now two theory books and two performance books, and this will gain will allow us some new material to come into play on our journey. Um, you can see how it advances um, in keys. We're using C minor without a key signature. We have D major with a key signature and adding A minor, making sure the G sharp is happening. So a lot of this is just being reinforced from scale tales as well. Lots of new signs coming into play, um, not in an overwhelming way, just adding them, often with review as well. We're expanding rhythm and time signatures. Uh, we're still working with the uh, basic simple meter, but we do add the dotted quarter in that format. Uh, in the triple meter, you can see again hand crossing to introduce some new notes. And we're adding 6-4 time, only 6-4 time. And the reason it's 6-4 is because I need a known element, which is the quarter note value, which allows me to teach the compound meter really, really easily. If I go to 6-8 time, I'm going to create gaps in their learning, which become black holes at some point. So this is very easy. They know how to count this. I'm not changing note values and it becomes a very simple transition to compound meter. And this one is in a Dorian mode. You can see we have sight reading, we have theory in our activity pages, reminding you that these activity pages re, um, relate directly to the repertoire they're playing. And um, the theory book is more independent, but these activity pages cover everything from sight reading, improvisation, harmonization, transposition, audio development, technique, written exercises, you've got the checklists, you're pre-teaching, and you, you have great visual cues for people to work through. Here's some of the techniques showing up, moving these from major to minor. Um, we have improv with using the G major five finger pattern. We're teaching triads in this book, which is basic technique at this level. We're even having them to start looking at some lead sheets at this point. Lots of interesting and various types of repertoire. Um, the damper and unicorda pedal are being used here. That Chinese garden is in a pentatonic scale, written pentatonic. Most of the ones we've seen have been done as pre-reading. We've got folk music, we've got a boogie. Um, we're bringing in things like more jazz. Um, classical composers are here as well. Triplet eights are coming into play, grace notes are being added and ledger lines are being added throughout. This is one of the few times that I actually use photographs. Um, and this is for things like arm weight, slurs. We haven't talked a lot about legato to this point because we're just letting it happen naturally through dinosaur scales, five finger patterns, um, the idea of hand position, watching the student, knowing when they're ready. And 
So again, and I haven't talked much about this book, which I think is a really valuable resource for you. It's uh, Creative Teaching, Let's Begin Understanding Learning Styles in the Beginning Piano Student. So it can, gives you lots of ideas and I'll give you some uh, sample pages in a couple minutes here um, on how to teach some of these things, how to pre-teach some of these things. So they have an understanding of them before they have to physically use these things. And that allows us to move into two measured phrases or slurs, three note phrases and longer phrases. And of course, there you can see we have a little Bach piece and um, listening gain. So some notes on the composers here. We're covering terminology that's important at this level, whole steps, half steps, Expanding on the use of the damper pedal, we start with a continuous pedal and an improvisation. Um, when we, this particular example in the C and do has a long continuous pedal that releases. So we take it one step at a time. We don't re-release it, we simply release it. And that example actually is also teaching hand over hand um, arpeggios, which is the first type of arpeggio that I teach rather than extended hand. And then we get an exercise where we're actually teaching legato pedaling um, on this um, page with the triads. They're an excellent way to work through this with a checklist on how to do it. So this kids simply have to do a, as, um, as Deborah says, <laughs> Simon says, follow each one carefully. And if they learn legato pedaling as they would do for Mist by Clifford Poole, um, they can do all other types of pedaling readily. So it's, it's one of the best ones to move to and sets them up for success following that. Again, you can see what happens in our theory books. At this level, we're expanding intervals. They go on treasure hunts. So this is analysis. They're going through looking at things, really understanding how you would approach this from a written analysis to uh, sight reading. You don't just start playing. You look at it and understand it. Whole steps even introducing uh, basic scale writing, very simplified. I wanna to just touch on this because <clears throat> we've talked about rhyming extensively. And we can <clears throat> use this in, to our benefit throughout the, um, our, <clears throat> our teaching at this level. Um, so I'm really big on making sure that these things have context. <clears throat> and just like using finger plays, we can, come back to these really quickly by just starting them off on a little rhyme. And so I like to use the C's as signposts as well. So um, this is about, this is called C for yourself. Middle C sits here just fine between the staves on a ledger line. So that's middle C. Count up or down the space is three and here you'll find the space note C's. Now way up high or down real low on two ledger lines, more C's will go. So it's a really simple concept. I make them learn this. This becomes one of those refrigerator challenges that we talked about. Put it on the fridge. Everybody in the family is supposed to learn it to help you do it. And I just, if they're having trouble reading that note, I just start by saying middle C sits and then they, off they go. So it's like, if you say 30 days, days has September, <laughs> oh, any wrong that sticks in your mind. But here's another one. One of the reasons we have students have trouble using these rhymes that we give them to name lines and spaces is because there's no context. Um, so if we, if we change it and say, what are the lines of the treble clef, E, G, B, D, F? Suddenly it has context because it's about the treble clef. If you use every good boy deserves fine, good boys help. Those, they're too confusing. The kids can't remember what they're for because there's no context attached. The spaces are the same. If you need a treble space, just put on a happy face, F-A-C. And those little cues will stay with them for life and make reading an awful lot easier. Again, just a quick look at some of the performance material. Uh, fun, can be mixed and match with any series. And there's actually a book three of, of for the theory fun books just about out of time, but I want to go through this one. This list is in your book, so I'll go through quickly. But I want to show to you, you what makes this and your students conservatory grade one, basically level um, ready when they're finished because we've used the same methodology. They are reading four octaves 
We've used strong sensory modalities. And as we start to do different types of looking music, this becomes really important. We've uh, offered them the backing tracks to help with rhythm, memory, harmonization, all of these things. They're playing hands together. There are uh, repertoire with left hand melodies. So that's really helpful. We've transitioned our time signature to include these signatures along with common time and six four. They've, they know all of these note values as well as the triplet, which does show up at grade one. We've expanded dynamics, which is typically this group. Other musical signs that they're going to see in grade one, staccato, legato, two and three note slurs, as well as phrases. They're reading ledger lines at, to at least two ledger lines above and below the stop. They've done pickups, upbeats. Um, they've done a little bit with damper pedal, continuous and legato style and have um, used the unicorder pedal. They're doing sharps, flats, and naturals, as well as key signatures for C, G, F, and D. They're also playing A minor and C minor, not with a key signature, but uh, pentatonics. They've done Dorian and Lydians. They've done whole tones, blue scales. Uh, posture check has been reviewed and adapted for growing children. They're doing sight reading, oral development, transposition, improvisation, harmonization, realizing lead sheets, and doing written exercises that support all of that. Doing intervallic reading, they know whole tones, semitones, they're playing thirds, harmonic fifths. We've incorporated familiar and seasonal tunes as well as classical works, folk songs, um, and varied jazz pop sounds. They have activity boxes that differ, of course, from the theory, um, but they all include all of these important aspects that make them ready for uh, what's required at grade one. Technique, they've done pentascales, they've done one octave scales, triads, they've done hand over hand arpeggios. So they're more than ready for grade uh, two for two octave scales. And the hope is that you will have through creative activities incorporated all major and minor scales by this point. The supplemental material um, has also been presented in a way that they can uh, adapt to all styles of music. And um, again, you can mix and match other supplemental material along the way. Um, the Northern Lights work well with it. Some of the, like the um, introductory level books work well from the conservatories with all of this. They can do Christmas books and whatever they're working on. But it really is, um, I think, uh, they're, they're more than ready for grade one. Some of your students who struggle a little bit more may be more at the introductory level and just need more supplementary material to reinforce what they need. But we're already at that point where we're ready to start moving forward. Um, today, I have included some testimonials that I'll just leave you to look at. I want to just show you a little bit about um, what this book is about. There's lots of charts and lists. I've given you a few sample pages, uh, which show start to show up on page 11 in the handout. Again, I'm not going to spend time here, but it shows you that um, how different sensory modalities will impact um, students. And this is how it actually impacts you as an educator. So that particular chart tells you what you will do and what you might need to do more of. Um, there's one on language within the book as well. It, it relates to the creative, to the Let's Begin series. So as you can look at that and look at other method books thinking about the things that are, are there as well. It does pre-teaching for you. It shows you how you can pre-teach legato and staccato from the inside out, how to teach arm weight from the inside out. So these are just, of course, partial pages, but I would encourage you to look at this. This is a book that works for new teachers, for experienced teachers, but I know a lot of teachers who lend this to their new parents, as well, their new music parents, because if a parent learns differently than their child, that can create some real struggles at home during practice time. So it becomes really important that we think about that. This is my favorite quote um, that I will end with. There are no difficult students, just students who don't want to do it your way. And, and I think we need to embrace that statement. So yeah, that's, that's a great way to end, Deb. Thanks for that quote. <laughs>
<laughs> and for everything else today. This is a really, really great presentation again in such detail. Um, if anyone has any questions, again, throw them in the chat box. Uh, raise your hand if you want to come on live. We're certainly open to having a chat here today. We can bring on your audio. You don't have to worry about your, your video necessarily. And the readiness for grade one, that's one thing that I've often forget to talk about that I've always been concerned about, you know, trying to find a way to bridge that gap. And then I finally realized after many years that if there's a gap, there's just something wrong with the way I'm doing it. But I, oh. what I'm hearing you say is that this is seamless. This seamlessly would go into the Northern Light series beautifully at the grade one level when you're done A, B, and C. Is that right? Yes. Um, a, B, C, D. D is already, you can probably start introducing some of those materials at D level. It will depend on the child, but um, for sure, by the time they're finished D and, and we're back to the, it just makes sense that this is a Canadian product because I think that's one of the breakdowns we've experienced. I'm not, again, I'm, I'm not criticizing other methods, but if we're using only American products, which have not traditionally had conservatory systems like we have, they mm -hmm. stay in their method books much longer. So right. that, that impacts what the product looks like. And suddenly we're moving them into conservatory work when they haven't learned enough concepts that prepare them for that. One thing I forgot to mention that on page 13, I actually threw in the uh, assessment things if someone wants to take those um, uh, for dispositions and sensory modality. So there's a quiz that's developed um, and I've expanded it to include all four sensory modalities. So they're just there for, for fun for teachers to look at and, and if they want to see where they land. So. Right. And this ties into a question Stacy's posed here in the chat box. Do your students miss the method book once you transfer them over to the conservatory? Um, no, not really, um, because I tend to, I tend to overlap. Um, so that they are prepared for that. And, and I tend to also have more than just those books. By the time they're in C and D, they have more books than that that have a similar look because visual students can have difficulty. And that, again, that's a problem with where the method books is dependent on all of the same. So if you have four level one books, mm -hmm. everything looks the same and is dependent on what they're playing. And that's why I purposely have the theory books that are different. The performance books look different in many ways compared to what they're doing in their method book. And so I think that's the key is to make sure that you are already preparing them for that visual change. And so my kids don't because I'm very conscious of that and that it can be a problem. Have I experienced that in the past before I knew better? But once you know better, you do better, right? <laughs> Yeah. So. Okay. Anyone, any other questions from everyone? I I'm noting that just some very creative aspects here in, in the supplements that you have. And that was one of my other questions, you know, how much do you ri rely on supplementation? But I think you've answered that question. You have so much to draw from, from your own library and your own publications that you put out over the last couple of decades. Yeah. Uh, and students and, are well armed. <laughs> yes. And, and I can't, I've said this a few times and we talked about this before we started today, one of the things I can't say enough is don't fall into the trap of with these with these great method books that we have at our fingertips to be a turn the page teacher. It doesn't work that way for these little people. And I, I would really recommend that it's the I don't know if there's anyone here who has the book, but the, the little textbook that I just talked about, the creative teaching. Once you read through that, it's you'll have light bulb moments, I think, for any method book to how can I bring this into play here? What is missing on this page? Is there a gap and how am I going to deal with that? So. Right, right. No, that's really good. I like too that you featured today the learning styles and, and you gave us some idea about how to identify which learning style those, those students are sort of working with. Sometimes that's, that can take us time sometimes. And sometimes you get a year or two in before you realize, but it's a real art to sort of identify that early on when you can in a six or seven year old, it can be kind of difficult at first when everything just seems to be rather equal. Sometimes it could take time for those to emerge. Exactly, exactly. And it's that whole thing of, of us needing to spend a great deal of time learning from the child and understanding. Yeah. And again, that creative teaching text has all kinds of charts for the children outlining features and language, what they're going to use and, and, 
and that sort of thing. So it's kind of, I'm not a learning style specialist um, and it's very condensed. Uh, so it's, we're just talking the tip of the iceberg here, but yeah. we don't have to be learning style specialists to embrace the very basic needs that I think are not only our, our beginners, but everyone needs in, mm -hmm. in their studies. Yeah. Well, I look forward to trying this method out myself. I would like to do it now that I've got beginners coming through my studio again the last few months, uh, just to see how it works and everything. You've certainly piqued my curiosity, and I hope many of you will take a look at it as well. Um, not seeing any other questions at this point for you, Deb, but I know a lot of people are going to watch this on replay, and anybody watching this later on YouTube, you can find Deb's handout, a link to it, in the description of the show notes there in the YouTube uh, recording that you're watching. Um, same for part one. Go back and check out part one from this from this presentation. It was a real great masterclass, beginner teaching, as as part two was here as well. But you can find Deb's slideshow notes and handouts there for you to download. Uh, Deb, any, any other last words or parting words before we break here? Um, no, other than you know, if if you want to reach out to me, feel free. Um, sometimes I get a little bogged down with emails, but I'm happy to chat with and with any of you if if you are so inclined and easy email. It's just Deborah at DebraWallace.ca. So Excellent. can't really mess it up. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us today then for part two like this and, and best of luck as you get forward into retirement. And if, if spring ever settles in here in the middle of the country, I know between where you are and I am, I mean, it's very much still winter here, which is kind of <laughs> strange, but as spring takes hold and then we move into summer rather quickly, hope that your retirement plans come to fruition. I know you announced to us last week what you were up to and, and how you've transferred everything over to Andrew Harbridge and Carissa Harbridge at Harbridge Publishing, but you're still very much active and, and we appreciate you. Oh yeah, that. I'm not going away. I think it's, a, didn't David Suzuki said, it's not really retirement, it's just doing things differently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we look forward to having you back next year too, if you're able, and you always have lots to talk about and lots to share, and we certainly learn a lot from you. So thanks for that. Yeah. Thank you, Derek. Okay. Thanks everyone. Have a good weekend and we'll see you all next Friday. Bye for now. <laughs>